Alrighty, so we're going to have our first week of thinking about critters. And for this first week of invertebrate paleontology, I'm going to focus on reefs. These are buildups that could sink a ship. That's the easiest way to describe it. And if we think about our modern world, we think of reefs as being dominated, at least visually dominated, by uh, corals and sponges. These are animals that build hard skeletons. And there's been other critters in the past that have done it and some actually some kind of interesting times in Earth's history. We'll get to that later, uh, where things like clams built the reefs. But um, a big one, at least in my world, are stromatolites. And stromatolites are rock buildups that are built up by the action of microbes, usually cyanobacteria, but it could be other kinds of microbes that through their actions cause rocky buildups and the first reefs. And by first reefs, I mean insanely first reefs. Stromatolites, bona fide stromatolites that I would say most researchers agree are stromatolites, go back at least 3.4 or so, maybe 3.5 billion years ago to Western Australia. There's older rocks that may be stromatolites, but Either way, 3.5 billion years is pretty amazing, especially when you think sponges, the next big critters to build reefs, uh, didn't come in until the early Cambrian, which is around you know 500 and something million years ago. Anyways, so this week we're going to cover stromatolites, we'll cover corals, we'll cover sponges, and because we're wrapping this in, even though the headline is reefs, it's a good time to talk about the algae. Now, a lot of algae don't leave a great fossil record, so we're going to focus on those algae that have the amazing fossil record. Now, as this is the first of these series of uh, weekly, like discussing the critters, let me fill you in real quick on what I'm doing here. The students in the invertebrate paleontology class at Chico State, they'll be getting a handout that has a lot of details. It'll talk about, for each group, the biology of the organisms, at least as much biology as a geologist should, should probably understand. They'll talk about, and that includes some of the ecological interactions, so biology and ecology. Next, kind of the geological history. You know, when do these organisms appear? When is there acme? Are there any major extinctions that happen? And then a section that I call the view from the geologist. Now, at Chico State, invertebrate paleontology is a required course in the geology degree. All geologists, we feel, should have this class. And so I want to give back and say, well, then, fine. What should every geologist know about this group? And these are pretty short sections. And my goal is that the students at Chico State could then keep these, these documents forever as a reference, kind of like their own personal reference for the invertebrate fossil record invertebrates plus algae. All right. So um, I'm not going to go over that because that's on a handout and you can read it. So I want to use this YouTube time to really focus on the things that I feel a student would be worth uh, hearing before they came to class, before they looked out and saw these fossils on the table and looked at these at these handouts, and maybe give some time to ask questions about some of the more maybe philosophical or overarching ideas that come out of these videos. So let's start with my favorite fossil. Yes, I do have a favorite fossil. It's stromatolites. Why stromatolites? Well, uh, because they're not dinosaurs. No, uh, stromatolites to me are amazing because it's, a, it's the fossil record of some of the earliest engagements of biota with the environment, true geobiology. And in many ways, if you really want to get excited about astrobiology or exobiology, looking for a fossil record on other extraterrestrial objects, you're not going to be looking for big footprints. What you're going to look for is interactions of microbes that are harvesting electrons, doing all kinds of crazy uh, um, ways to move carbon, because that's we only have a data point of one. We think life is based on carbon. How to kind of incorporate carbon, move it around by also gaining energy through different oxidation reduction. It's all about metabolisms. And metabolisms can happen in the microbial world without leaving a rock record for sure, although we'll get into that at, in another lecture. But um, but if you want to touch it, if you want to actually physically touch interactions of microbes in their environment, we look for these, these rock structures built by microbes, which are in general called microbialite. So let's talk about this term microbialite. Microbialite means a rock structure that is built by the actions of microbes. Now, 
What do you mean built by that? Well, it could be that the microbes themselves being this organic coating at, at a very small scale, like a millionth of a meter, right? A one micrometer, um, that, that they uh, maybe just by having an organic compound, the fluids cause crystals to form. Or maybe because they're sticky, either they're individually sticky or they're part of a mat of, of sticky objects, or they create some kind of a goo, an extra cellular polymeric substance that's sticky and it traps grains. It could be mud grains, silt grains, maybe even gigantic to them, sand grains. So it could be fostering cements. It could be that they're trapping grains. Sometimes these microbes grow out over sediments and in doing so they trap the sediments underneath it. That's another way. And then uh, another possibility is that the microbes themselves, either because they have to or it just happens to them, their bodies become crystallized. And so you get an actual skeletal microbiolite. Those are the main ways we find microbiolites. Now, there's uh, some terms from what you'd see like with a hand lens looking at, at kind of a centimeter or millimeter to centimeter scale of a microbiolite. And one of the terms you may have heard is stromatolite. Now, stromatolite is specifically a, uh, a microbialite, although some would argue we should use the term even if we don't know the biology. Um, and, and I agree, actually. But regardless, a stromatolite is a term for, for one of these rocks that has a lamination to it, layered like layers of a book or layers of an onion. On the other hand, you might find a rock that you think is built by microbes, so it's a microbialite. You don't see the layering. Instead, what you see is lots of little clotted texture of different um, uh, maybe muds and grains. It's just kind of a, a hodgepodge mix of clots. And the term for that is thrombolite. It's the thrombros, uh, thrombos, uh, that, that prefix that also is used in cancers and things like that for clots. So the clotted rock is thrombolite layered as stromatolite. Other ones that look like they're made of little tiny bushes. By tiny, I mean kind of millimeter scale bushes. And so we would refer to those as dendrolites. And then there's a fourth term that I really like that Rob Riding, I believe, coined. Hopefully that's correct. Um, where you look at a rock in the field that really looks like it should be microbialite, but you don't see layers, you don't see clots, you don't see bushes. And so he uses the term laolite for sort of an unknown kind of potential microbialite. Now, adding to that, there are round, um, concentric, although they don't have to be uh, spherical. They could be weird-shaped, but still rounded with these semi-concentric layerings. And we call those onchoids, and they make up a bed called an oncolite. Um, and let's see, what else? Oh, then there's this whole category of things that are called MIS, or microbially induced sedimentary structures. And this is pretty cool. And so you think about these not as like hard rocks, not as reefs, per se, but we know that there are microbial mats that grow out over sand or muds. And sometimes you can preserve those layers in the rock record. In fact, there's an amazing site in South Africa in the Barberton Mountains or the Bahwanja Mountains, where the 3.23 billion year old Moody's formation, uh, which was kind of a shallow marine to even terrestrial deposit right on the margin of the ocean at that time, uh, as those sandstones preserve beautiful layered organic lines that many of us believe are microbial mats. And those would be an example of a mist structure. So <clears throat> keeping on with, with the microbial story, so what do we do with them as fossils? How do we recognize them? Here is where microbialites are um, different from other kinds of fossils like clams or trilobites. It is absolutely critical that a researcher, and this means you, when you find them in the field, that you make careful notes to describe them at all the scales. You know, I just got through saying stromatolites, thrombolites, that's like the centimeter scale or what we call the meso structure. But then there's a bigger structure. Do those lines or those clots, do they form branches? Do they form domes? Do they form columns? Do they form sheets? Things that are kind of at the centimeter to maybe meter scale. And we would refer to that as the macro structure. So that has to go into a description as well. Then there's an even bigger scale of like, well, these, these mats or these uh, layers or domes or columns or branching bushes, whatever they are, where do they stack in the environment? Are they, are they layer upon layer upon layer that might go for a kilometer 
Is it just one little lens? Is it a, a dome and we can see where, where it gets thin towards the margins? And so for this, we term this the megastructure. So the megastructure, the macrostructure, the mesostructure, and then you can get down with a microscope or maybe geochemical techniques, and that's the microstructure. And it's important to really describe, if, if you only describe the stromatolites at, or microbialites at one of those scales, you've missed it. And here's why. This brings up something which myself and my buddy Frank Corsetti have, have termed the pendulum. And it's the pendulum of like, is it abiotic or biotic? Now, let's say you found a whale bone and you don't say to yourself, I wonder if this was created biologically. Is this evidence of past life? It's a flipping bone. It's evidence of past life. But what do you do with a stromatolite or one of these microbial structures? Well, let me show you on the board. So imagine we've created this pendulum and it can swing. Maybe things are more abiotic. Maybe things are more biotic. And uh, so what would be some examples? Uh, yes, you in the back. Yeah, because over here, it's you too. Um, I'll answer for myself. How about if it's made of carbon? Yeah, that's not proof positive. It's not a golden spike for sure. But if you're finding something is made of carbon, I would say that would mean it more likely. Again, it's not guaranteed, but more likely towards the biotic side. Now, if you say that the rock itself is made of minerals that are metamorphic, yeah, that's pretty shaky because we know metamorphism occurs at temperatures and pressures that are less likely to preserve biology. What about, uh, we looked at the big scale, the megastructure, we say this is a shallow marine environment. That's a great place to form a reef. Again, it's not proof positive, but it's more likely than not be biotic and you start building more of these lists and this is why having this scale the megastructure the macrostructure mesostructure microstructure is so critical because you're really gathering yourself a list of more or less abiotic or biotic features and here's the idea when you work in early life or you're working in astrobiology chances are you're going to have a very tough time proving beyond a doubt that, that the, the fossil structures you're looking at are evidence of past life. And we're okay with that. Frank and I are okay with that. And many of our friends are okay with that. Instead, what you wanna do is you wanna say, I've gathered the evidence and taken together that evidence is more, the pendulum is more abiotic. So it's probably not a fossil or it's more biotic and it's probably a fossil until the next person comes along and reevaluates our work and decides to shift the pendulum one way or the other. Cause that's the way science works. It's not supposed to give you answers. Science is supposed to give you the best answer today. And then you know that maybe tomorrow might be a different answer. So let's talk about stromatolites. I have here a little friend of mine, one of the lovely stromatolites. This little guy here is middle-aged stromatolite. It's two point one billion years old. It came from Wyoming. And um, how do I know it's a stromatolite? Well, what you're missing here is the whole megastructure and macrostructure. This was collected in the field. We know where it came from. We know that it was part of an environment that is more likely than not to be actual microbialite or at least stromatolytic, as opposed to maybe like just some layered rocks caught up in a fault or something like that. Now, assuming that, let's look at this a little more detailed. Um, the, and I'm holding it the way it would have been found um, in the rock layers. So below we see these nice flat layers. I'm not thinking those are microbial. Those are probably like muds and sands that were on this, uh, we're presuming ocean, uh, a seabed. Problem with 2.1 billion year old rocks, there's no sharks. It's hard to tell if the thing is marine or not. But then in the middle, we see this weathered out but preserved conical structure. And so we would say this is a conical macrostructure. It's a cone. And if we look in a little closer at it, we can see that that cone is made up of these alternating lines, which are known as lamina. And 
I've just said it several times, we have to describe these things at all these different scales in order to talk about biogenicity. Lamina is a real critical one because the lamina are what's going to tell us the actual, as close as we can to the microbes with their interacting with their environment or microecology, or the view, if we want to use fancy terms, of the localized microbial ecosystems. And so those of us that study stromatolites, we spend a lot of our time with microscope slides or with, with, with eye loops or hand lenses looking at these rocks and really detailing the lamina. Are they smooth? Are they wrinkly? Are they thick? Are they thin? What's their chemical composition? And so when you describe a stromatolite and you want to get that information to somebody else, because you're out in the middle of Canada on the side of a hill and you're not going to collect all these stromatolites, but you want to make good field notes, describing the lamina is really critical, as well as the macro structure, the shape, and all of these other features that you can do. Because when you take that sum total, not only can you just sort of address this pendulum about whether it's biotic or abiotic, but knowing the subtotal will tell you immense information potentially about the environment and where this formed. Was it shallow? Was it deep? Because again, no sharks that long ago. And uh, maybe it was a lake environment. Maybe it was a river environment. And so we, uh, these are our clues in order to understand the past. Now, in closing off this section on stromatolites, I will say, again, in the beginning, I mentioned the students in the class get a handout with the view from the geologist and which also about the biology and the geological time. Let's just say stromatolites dominate Earth's history. If you looked at the geological time scale to scale, stromatolites go back at least 3.5 billion years ago, and other fossils don't really come in in abundance until the Cambrian, the famous Cambrian explosion with this little experimental time, an important experimental time in the Ediacaran. Um, so even if we count the Ediacaran, maybe these fossils that go back about 600 million years or so, you're talking 3 billion versus 600 million. And so most of Earth's history is dominated by stromatolites. Once other reef organisms or other things that like to munch on microbes on the cyanobacteria or other kinds of bacteria evolved, uh, we see a real decline in the rock record of stromatolites throughout what we call the Phanerozoic with some really important exceptions. And it's those important exceptions, if you find them mapping or doing some study of the geology of an area that really piques our interest. Like why would we all of a sudden have stromatolites again? We know there was a peak occurrence in the late Cambrian, even though the sponges had already been building, building reefs and that lasted into the early Ordovician until finally more different and more sponges. Learn about that next and corals come in and then there's, there seems to be maybe some blips of some peaks coming in after extinctions in the marine realm. Still a lot of work to be done there. But we do see within lake environments in the Phanerozoic some really phenomenal uh, uh, microbialite deposits, including the amazing uh, stromatolites found in the United States in the Eocene in the Green River Formation. Just stunning examples that go for miles and miles of shoreline of this ancient Eocene lake. Um, thrombolites as a structure, don't, they go back at least to the Neoproterozoic, and, and there's some record of, of older ones. They really come into, they're pretty dominant in the Cambrian. There's different ones in the early middle Cambrian, some other ones in the, in the late Cambrian. And then we see um, thrombolites again kind of peak up in the Devonian for a little bit. And then we see them in the, in the Carboniferous and even a little bit into the Triassic. Dendrolites, I think, are a little less poorly known because of just the, the literature is not quite as rich, but we see abundant dendrolites in the Cambrian, and we also see them also in the Devonian, and there's still a lot of work to be done on those. So, takeaway for stromatolites, coolest fossil ever, long, 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 long fossil history, and you have to really describe them at all of these different scales of observation because they can tell you how microbes are interacting with their environment. And the extra bonus of that is if you want to look at the early evidence of life on Earth or astrobiology, they're going to be pretty much limited to these stromatolites or chemistry. And that's it. Cheers. <laughs>